Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeffrey Moore to the stage. Thank you, thank you, great. So, wow, so that whole video is about sort of pattern detection, and in a sense this whole conference is about pattern detection. I just wanna share with you a few additional patterns to sort of help you get a sense of where we are right now, because this is one of those special moments at the beginning of a technological wave where, where it, it's, you're gonna remember this moment years from now. And, and getting, capturing exactly where we are can help you focus, what do we need to get done in 2012? Because this thing's gonna go on for a long time. It's gonna, it's gonna evolve in all kinds of ways we can't predict. But what you wanna do at the beginning of a wave is capture as much as possible of the opportunity at the beginning to get it on the right course. And over the last several decades, we've learned a bunch about how technology revolutions and disruptions evolve. And I kind of want to try to put the Hadoop sort of evolution revolution in that context to just share with you some of the frameworks that, that the industry has been using over the last two decades to say, okay, where are we and kind of where, where do we go next? The theme of this thing is, the big thing is we're digitizing the world, which is like big, right? It's like the entire world's going from analog to digital. That's a big change. It, it, it's pretty, pretty, pretty dramatic. So where are we in that process? So here, here's how I parse it. Now, you know, I'm parsing of this kind of a little bit against my own autobiography. So there's been four decades that I've been involved with this industry. The first decade was the decade of the PC. It was the decade of office automation. It was, it was that first burst of release for the knowledge worker. For the, for the person who was a, you know, wanted to make an intellectual contribution, typically out of the middle of the organization. It, was, it, it, it fundamentally changed the, the experience of being in business, but it didn't actually change the economics of business very much. We, 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 we should say it was a lot more fun to do. The next decade changed the planet. Because in the next decade, what happened was all of that personal stuff got hooked up to the enterprise back office systems. We had client server architectures. And then we had the internet allow us to deploy these architectures globally. And then we discovered that the internet was not really an information highway, it was a work transport highway. And we drove enormous amounts of work across the Pacific Ocean to do manufacturing in China and to do, to do services in India. And we fundamentally changed two of the, of, the, of the largest nations in the world from really abject poverty to now China is the second largest economy in the world and will clearly be the largest economy in the world in my lifetime, assuming I don't get hit by a truck fairly soon. And India is kind of right behind and that was like unimaginable. And it's created some stress and strain in the developed economies but in terms of a foreign aid program, that's like the world's largest foreign aid program ever. And it completely restructured the way we do business because now we're doing business more horizontally across many companies, whereas prior to that, we always did business vertically inside a company. And that was true in tech, right? The first early tech companies, you know, whether it was Digital or IBM or Wang or Prime or Data General or Burroughs or Univac, any of those guys, you bought everything from one company, the software, the, the disk drives, the networks, the whole thing the services, everything. We completely disaggregated that, and we discovered when we disaggregated, we became incredibly innovative because if specialists can spend most of their time on their specialty, that, that really changes the productivity of the world. It, it creates a lot of disruption and a lot of chaos, but it's, it's amazingly productive at scale. Okay, so that was the 90s. Then the next one is, the, the, this last decade has been this digital kind of revolution of the consumer life and the consumer experience and, we, we've talked about it so much, I'm not sure it needs any more talking, but give a little bit more slides on each one of these in just a second. But that's the one we've just been through and we're still going through it. But I would argue that we've probably passed the tipping point on this one. And that we're gonna, I don't think as the future of this is gonna be as dramatically impactful as the, as the last 10 years has been. I think it's gonna be a little bit, not more of the same, but more in the same genre. And the one that I think I'm getting awful excited about right now, and that I think you are li we are right in the cusp of, is how does the rest of the world, particularly the business world, the government world, the institutional world, absorb the digitization that has happened in the consumer world? Because right now, arguably, our Saturdays and our Sundays were masters of the universe, and Monday through Friday were dweebs, right? I mean, you go to work and it's like, boom, your productivity just de-escalates dramatically. And so couldn't we, bring it, couldn't we bring it back up? And that's kind of where this is headed. 
Let me just, I'm going to take those last three decades. I just want to give you like one slide on each one. And then I'm going to try to say, now, where does this effort that works here at the center today about fit into that pattern? So just to put this in perspective, the 90s, the enterprise IT thing, this was all about, and it really was the 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, it was a three-decade play on putting together what we, called, what we now call systems of record. Basically, the great database systems, which became relational in the 80s and then have stayed relational pretty much ever since. Structured information, the, the, the whole thing. All the applications that you've heard of, we moved them from mainframes to minis, to PCs, to client server, to the internet, to SaaS. I mean, we've been migrating the infrastructure and we've been building out the systems. And it, it, three decades of investment, you know, all the, all the database apps and then all the business intelligence apps that could sit on top of that kind of stuff. And basically, when we got to Y2K, we decided to do it one more time all over again. Right? And after that, it was like, enough. It's like, I, am, I, I went to Thanksgiving dinner, I ate everything on the table, either from SAP or Oracle. Right? And, and, and I feel like a foie gras, you know? And, and California has now passed a law against foie gras, and I understand why as a CIO, because I ate too much you know, at Y2K. So, so for the last decade, what the, what the, actually what's been going on is enterprise IT has kind of been in a digestion decade, been virtualizing things, maybe taking them into managed hosting situations, making things more productive because our, what, what our business counterparts told us was, you know what guys, you guys are kind of like the internet highway system, inter interstate highway system. We, we had to build you. You are the key to global commerce. But you know what, we're done, we're done. Now, we're not really done. I mean, nothing's ever done. But, we're the, but the big, massive build-out is done. And we're now in a much more of a, come on, now let's maintain and, and go forward. And by the way, the budget to maintain should not be even close to the budget to build out. And so what you've seen is enterprise IT budgets shrinking over the last decade and do more with less and you know that, that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, this consumer IT thing just took off. I, 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 I think in, in a way that was unimaginably fast, at least to someone of my generation. What was going on was the digitization of human culture. Right? Everything was getting digitized. I mean, not just, not just media, not just social communications, education, healthcare, romance, food, warfare, uh, anything that you can make digital is becoming digital, and that turns out to be all of human culture. Now, there's kind of three principles, I think, that have underlined this, that have kind of, the, 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 if you say, well, how big or how, how much are the rules changing, really? I mean, so it's digital, so isn't it the same world? I mean, come on. There's three things I think fundamentally you go, no, it's not the same world. And the first one of these is access. When I, I, I would, you know, you're going to hear from two speakers this morning who have doctorates. Phil's is in bone, something around bone medicine, and mine's in medieval English literature. Just, so we thought of having a panel on that, but we said, no, maybe not, maybe not. But the point is, he and I actually went to a place called a library, and in that library, we went to a place called the Stacks, and we went into this weird, and we pulled information out physically and with some significant effort. Nobody would do that anymore, right? The, 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 we now have libraries, but they don't have books in them, right? It's, the access has been completely changed. It, I mean, the, the access to information of any kind. We were talking over the other thing. Somebody's saying, I can't remember the command for this thing. Well, why don't you just Google it? You Google it and you, you get it. I mean, you Google it and you get it. That is kind of the fundamental act of, 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 of cognition and access in the contemporary world. Do you realize how hard that makes it to be a dictator? If you want to have an oppressive regime, it's really hard. You can't keep people in the, you know, down on the farm anymore because they have too much access. So universal access, it is revolutionizing the political and social climate of our world. We see it here a little bit, but frankly, it's not here that it's making the difference. You, the, the Arab Spring thing, what's going on, what's happening in China, what's happening everywhere in the world, it's because of access. So that, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. That is fun, that has made it very difficult for Mr. Putin to be a dictator. Really hard, okay? I don't sympathize with him as much maybe as he would want me to, but anyway, access. Second one, broadband. 
So what happened with access? Access was access to the mind. In the 90s, when you used a computer, you used your brain, you used your intellect, you used your reasoning, you were, you were searching for things, you learned things like Boolean search arguments, right? Hmm, okay, it's fine. That's not what broadband's about. Broadband's about video. It's a, well, first of all, we discovered it with photographs, and then we discovered it with video, and all of a sudden, you, and, then, and then you discover it with an iPad, and you realize for the, for the first time in a long time, you are lusting after an electronic instrument, right? Which seems a little bit perverse, but apparently universal, okay? And, and, and by the way, little children, you see them on YouTube, right? They're doing this, right? And either they're doing it to an iPad and giggling, or they're doing it to a magazine and saying this magazine is broken, you know, but, right? So, it's, but the whole point, it's become an emotional place. We, it is not just our minds that are in the digital sphere, it's our hearts, it's our lives. And, 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 and so the focus group thing I heard about, that some uh, focus groups from some uh, sort of teenage type folks done for MTV and, and whatnot. One comment, my digital life is more real to me than my analog life, my, my life in the physical world. I totally get that. As an adolescent, I mean, heck, my imagine, my fantasy life was pretty more real to me than my real, so why wouldn't it be even more so in this broadband world? Really, really powerful. And then this third thing is mobile. And again, mobile in our society, kind of cool. Mobile in the rest of the world, fundamentally game-changing. Because for the first time, you get not one billion people on the web, you get five billion people on the web. So, so don't, uh, now this is what, I mean, th th this, I would argue, is the fundamental driving pillars of the last, of the last decade. And obviously these things have lots and lots and lots of future to them. But I kind of think, in some sense, we've absorbed, we haven't really absorbed, but we, we, we've been talking about it so much, maybe we're just tired of talking about it for a while. But, but, but these, this stuff is kind of, I think, already in play. And now the question is, okay, so what does it mean or how do we absorb it, where does it go? And in particular, because I spent most of my life in the enterprise side of this stuff, not on the consumer side, what is it going to do to enterprise IT? So that gets me now to the current decade. So th this, this to me was the last decade going forward, th this current decade. So I think there's two things that are going to drive an enormous amount of enterprise IT investment that will involve, the first one, this one in particular, involves everybody in this room. The next one does, but less directly. This directly involves everybody in the room. And it's this notion of, if I am going to have B to C relationships, business to consumer relationships at the scale of the internet, how do I how do I detect and analyze and respond to anything? Because it can't be personal. The scale won't work. If you don't have big data and analytics and you're trying to do business in a web enabled world, you're like being in the middle of 280 and you're blind and you're deaf. Because this is the sensory system. B big data and analytics is the sensory system of the web. If you, do not, if you are not connected to it, you are blind and deaf and you're in danger. And then we're watching companies in danger and going out of existence because they're getting smashed into on this freeway because they can't see and they can't hear. Your, your job is to give them a sensory system that works, right? that can help them see and hear. And what does that involve? Well, okay, so this, the, we saw this thing sort of coming in. Collaborative filtering was an early one. We saw, oh wow, that's pretty cool. If you know, birds of a feather do flock together and therefore, Jeffrey, I think you might be interested in these books because other people who bought the books that you bought also bought these books. That was pretty cool. Sensory, that was like a glimmer of light or sound uh, to, to the world. Behavioral targeting. Oh, okay, so, so basically if I know it's Jeffrey, I don't care if it's on that page or that page or that page, I want to make sure I, I, I get it to him and, and, I can, and, and, and his cookie, I don't know it's Jeffrey, but I know it's a cookie, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, who has the following history and I want to put an ad in front of that people or I'm retargeting, he's been to my place coming back, all that kind of stuff. Again, retargeting, you can see and you can hear. If you can't see and hear, you can't retarget, right? Same idea. Personalized transactions, okay? All of a sudden it's like, okay, I know you don't really know me, but these offers are getting much more relevant. Phil's gonna talk to you about some stuff they're doing uh, at Sears around this stuff. 
it's getting better and better and better. Does it have a long way to go? Sure, but that's but the, the, it's going to take it's going to take the work being done in this room to scale that out to the rest of the world. Location-based services. Okay, we've heard about all this stuff, right? Predictive analytics. Okay, machine learning, fraud detection, multi-channel communications, near-field transaction processing. I mean, all of this stuff. You go, wow, this is really, really, really cool stuff, and it's all big data analytics real time, okay? That, that's kind of the game that's being played here. And that's the fundamental game that, that is sort of the most obvious sort of basket of work that sits in front of this, uh, uh, in, in front of this uh, community right now. Now, there's a secondary thing that's happening, I think, in parallel, which I think is gonna have a more subtle use of this stuff, and that is as we disaggregated all of the business value chain and we said, look, we're all gonna be specialists interoperating with other specialists, we created a need to communicate and collaborate across companies, across time zones, across cultures, and, and we have these systems of record that help kind of keep the trains on the track, but there's always exceptions and expediting things and quality issues and design changes and inventory shortages. There's an enormous amount of stuff you have to solve for and you no longer can solve for it within the context of a single company. When it was in the single company, IBM had a product called Profs, and DEC had a product called All-in-One, and HP had a product called DEC, DEC, and it, you just, you, you used that product and it worked because it was all inside one company. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? And so now what we're gonna start looking at is, well, what does work? Well, if I had a Facebook, maybe enterprise Facebook is LinkedIn, or maybe it's an enterprise literally in a single enterprise instance of something. But I need something like Facebook, but not Facebook, right? I need something like YouTube so I can do product demos across the globe without having to fly someplace. I wanna do them over you know, telepresence or whatever, uh, or, and then record it and do it over YouTube. I want a search that works for the enterprise. The one thing, the one place you can't Google is you can't Google your ERP system. It sucks, right? You get a report. Nobody wants a report. All they want to do is search and find, okay? Big, big, big bu bunch of work to do. App stores, isn't there an app for that? You know, we're doing a budget. Have we ever done a budget before? Oh, gee, for the last 37 years, huh? Isn't there an app for that? Actually, no, there isn't. We screw it up every year in a new way, right? <laughs> okay. Couldn't we have an app for that, right? right? Could we have enterprise Twitter? I, I'd like to know what the heck's going on. Enterprise FaceTime, I'd like to be able to communicate face to face. Open table, how about open conference room? Is there any in the world? You know, I mean, just come on. You know, enterprise Dropbox, maybe box.net. Enterprise Foursquare, where are you? Could you check in? Would you like to become the mayor of our largest account? You know, come on, come on, okay? So the point is, all of that stuff that we do as consumers, we do as business people too. We do it in different contexts. And, and, and you look at this problem and you say, look, why don't we just have Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and all these guys do it for the enterprise? And the answer is, because they won't, because they're not interested. They've got, a, they've got a much bigger, they've got a big, big, big consumer world to, to cope with. They don't need to take on the complexity of the enterprise and they're not very good at it when they try. And then you say, well, what about all the enterprise guys? You say, oh yeah, you really understand. You're just so clueless though. I mean, how do I, I mean, like design? No, you guys, user experience? You were the people that brought us the, the green screens. I mean, come on, don't talk to us about user experience. So there's a, real, there's a real demand to find people who can live in that hybrid universe of saying, I respect and will embrace the complexity and the security and the demands of the enterprise. And I am totally committed to the user experience quality that we've just installed in our consumer lives over the last 10 years. That is a big, big, big business opportunity. We saw a version of this 15 years ago when the web came into the enterprise and there were companies like Scient and Viant and Sapient and all these kind of boutique consulting firms. We need it all over again for this, okay? We, we need to do, to do it again, okay? And so social, mobile, cloud, and again, you can't really do this stuff very effectively if you're not looking at the log files and figuring out kind of where are the patterns, what's the social graph, how do I start detecting this kind of stuff? And so if you look at those two trends, this is kind of what's going on. The entire infrastructure, the infrastructure that we spent 30, 40 years building, it, by the way, it's not going away. You need enterprise systems of record. 
they want to live in data centers. They actually do not want to live in the cloud. But all of this stuff has to live in the cloud. So then it becomes, that's the only place you can get it done. So this, how do we morph the stack? It's a big, big deal going on. So, so the key idea here is there's a lot of work to be done. And I think the question that's always interesting at this point in a technology revolution is when exactly is this thing gonna take off and where? And technology um, participants in this industry have a characteristic uh, ability, which is uh, lots of people have talked about, which is in the short term, we're always way, way, way too optimistic about when it's gonna happen. And in the long term, we underestimate it dramatically, okay? So we overestimate in the short term and we underestimate in the, in the, in, in the, in the long term. And I guess from the point of view of the human comedy, that's fine, we're kind of all fools and we can be fools again, but it's actually kind of wasteful. And, and I think the world actually is not in shape right now where waste is a very good idea. So I think we'd be, the more efficient we could be right now, I think like the, the better. So I wanna use this model. This model is a model we've been working with in the Valley since the early 90s, actually the 80s. And basically all it said is if you bring in any disruptive innovation into any community, the community will start self-segregating into these five strategies. The innovators who are the guys who get really excited about the technology. Most, many of you are in this room are, are innovators. If you could spend more time in that room than in this room, you're almost certainly an innovator you know, going forward. And then the visionaries who are saying, well, I don't know, I need to know exactly how the technology works, but I wanna get on this thing ahead of the group. I wanna go first. And then there's the early majority who are saying, no, I think we ought to kind of stick around and kind of hold on and let, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. I wanna study it. I'm, I'm here at the conference, but I'm here to learn, that kind of stuff. And then there's conservatives here, which is, actually they're not here, uh, because they're going, it's, it's, it's too soon, no, 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 no. And then the laggards, and the laggards are just pretty sure that you are all instruments of the devil. And you know, it's just kind of, you know, it's just no. Okay, now the thing we learned in the 90s that was kind of cool was we said, you know what? The first two groups are biased to go way early. And they create something we call the early market, which is a lot, of, and I'll talk a little bit more about how it's structured right now, but that's one state that we could be in right now, called the early market, driven largely by visionary and technology enthusiasts. And that, because they secede, and because the pragmatists hang back, it creates this thing we ended up calling the chasm, which had the effect of saying, when you innovate and you want to ignite innovation in a society, you actually have to do it twice. You have to light the fire in the beginning, in the early market, and then you either have to carry the torch across the chasm to light on the other side, or you have to start the fire again on the other side. I would argue that Apple, iPad, started the fire all over again, right? We had tablets for, I don't know, most of my adult life, uh, but they, they never crossed the chasm. So, so the key point about here is it matters which side of the chasm you're on. You have to play on both sides. The question is, where are we? The classic thing that you're gonna see on the other side to start the fire the second time is niche markets with very specific use cases. And we called that the bowling alley, each pin being a, a different use case in a different segment, et cetera. And then there is this remarkable phenomenon, which clearly is gonna happen to this infrastructure, which is no, 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 no. This isn't about use case one, use case two, use case three. This is like fabric for the universe. We just have to pave the universe with this stuff. And that's called the tornado, and, it's, and that goes forward. And then eventually it's like, yeah, sure. I mean, we've had it for years. What are you talking about? Electric power. You know, I, when I turn on the lights, people will go, ooh, wow. It's like, no, no, the, the lights go on. Right? Okay, okay, okay. And that's mainstream, okay? Now the question is, where are we? And this is kind of where I want to close with. When I, we just, this is the second piece of this thing. So, okay. So, let me give you the detection in, in you, your call, but I'm going to try to give you where I think we are right now. So the early market, the key people you look for are visionary line of business executives. The reason they're line of business executives is because they're moving money and budget from, from someplace else to a project that involves the new technology. When you find yourself creating budget before you can consume budget, you are in the early market. One of the characteristics of being on the other side of the chasm is the budget is already there. Okay? If the budget is not already there, you're still in the early market. The, why do people at that time do this? Because it's a lot of work to move budget, and it's a lot of career risk, a lot, because we're gonna get ahead of the other guys. We are going ahead of the herd, competitive advantage, we are gonna smoke them, right? 
what it takes to get it done is bespoke projects, custom projects that are designed specifically for that particular company in that particular situation with that particular uh, uh, um, uh, 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 intention. And, it, and when you pull together the whole product in the early market, it's largely a technology group of people, which is what I, th which is what I think I see in the other room. Now, I, I go around the other room, I see Karmasphere over there, uh, I, I, I saw Talent over there, I saw uh, uh, NetApps over there, I saw Splunk over there, obviously Hortonworks is everywhere. I think we're pulling together, Yahoo's, we're pulling together the, the technical whole product. And that's kind of the job of the early market. Pull together the technical part of the whole product, make sure these things can work and actually work at scale. Because there's a lot of work to do, because nothing actually works very well the first time out, as, as we know. Microsoft taught us that over and over and over again, okay? But release 3.0 did work, okay? okay? So just actually, can I just buy release 3.0? <laughs> In fact, can we just like release release 3.0? <laughs> just relabel it, okay? So, and, and by the way, the, the kind of partners and allies who matter here are, are partners who can also come and kind of make it up as they go along. So systems integrators, but more, more not so, I'm not so sure that the canonical systems integrators is who I mean here. I kind of mean the boutique systems integrators who just like make stuff happen because they care enough about it. Okay, that's the early market. I think media, intelligence, I thought there was gonna be a third, yeah, third one, okay, investing. I think those guys have all done this. The, 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 the algorithmic trading guys, the intelligence community, they don't talk a lot about it, but they've been doing a ton of this stuff. And media, digital media, has had to do this. So they were fundamentally early adopting uh, because of the way it, it all works. It's not an accident that Hadoop was, was born and, and incubated in a media company, right? Okay, now we go to the bowling alley. The bowling alley is a different game. The bowling alley is not about visionary line of business executives, it's about pragmatist to business managers and what they're trying to do is fix what we call a broken, mission-critical business process. This thing is just doesn't work. We are losing, I'm getting beat up on a daily basis. The CEO knows my name and it's not a good thing, right? That kind of problem. And so what I'm looking for, what the market is looking for is solutions for use cases and these classically grow up in vertical application uh, ver vertical application vendors who are specifically focused on a particular use case in a particular industry. Three I think we're in the middle of right now. I think travel had to do this early on. Fraud, uh, we saw that fraud little picture in, in, in our video. And interestingly, retail, although retail because Amazon was so powerful in the early market, it has now put the entire industry on notice. The entire retail industry, at least, at least in the United States, is like on notice. Act now or be Amazoned, okay? It's a verb, and it's not a good verb. It's not like Google. Google's a good verb. Amazon is a, Amazon happens in the passive voice, and it's not a good thing, right? I was Amazoned, right? <laughs> it's not like saying I was Googled. I was Googled, that's pretty cool. I was Amazon. that's very bad, very bad, okay. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. So, that, so there's a forcing function. The key to the bowling alley, it's about pain. Pain that forces pragmatists to act sooner than they otherwise would. What pragmatists really would like to do is wait until this thing works, the, the, the market leaders have kind of been sorted out, the architectures are pretty much de facto established, we kind of know who's who, and, and, and by the way, we're gonna use this in lots of different places, you know. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, we're, gonna, we're gonna have lots of applications for this sort of stuff. I'd like to see the, some big guerrilla vendors, sort of, you know, the way VMware was able to sort of sort out my virtualization thing. Okay, now I'm free to virtualize. But until VMware had kind of staked out that thing and had it validated, people didn't want to virtualize, right, uh, going forward. Same thing with any, any new technology. I think most of the supply chains, the wholesale supply chain, the manufacturing supply chain, the logistics, all that kind of stuff, Interestingly, advertising really should be earlier. But advertising right now is in one of those horrible situations where they make all of their money based on an obsolete business model, which is just terrifying because all of your margins come from, you, it's, it's, it's Kodak, right? It's, it's a terrifying thing. But there's, that's why they're, I think they're gonna be later in the game. They need to be earlier, but I think it's just very, very hard for that industry to move because it's economically conflicted. And that, then that makes it really hard. And then finally, there's Main Street, which are, you know, I hope, I mean, I guess this may happen in my lifetime, but I kind of hope it won't. 
you know, or if it does, I hope I've retired by then, that kind of folks. These are people who are saying, look, I don't think there's an urgent demand and I can go later. The interesting thing about Main Street though is, those are the three, two out of three of those, the first two in particular, we need to get this thing going, right? We, we need to get the healthcare and the education systems, you know, in a much, much, much more proactive footprint than they are today. And governments too. If, you know, we, well, in the Silicon Valley, we always have this approach avoidance thing with the government. But, 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 you know, to the degree that we could digitize and get that going, that'd be great. So my point about this thing is, I think this is a, this is not uh, a, 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 one of these charts that says this is the truth. This is a focus group of one, right? This is one person's point of view as to where kind of we are. But here's the point I want to make is I think in going through, looking at the materials, going through the next room, I see lots and lots and lots of signs of the early market. I don't yet see signs of the bowling alley, okay? I think we have, you're going to hear today, you're going to talk to each other today about use cases. I think there's still going to be exceptional use cases. The difference between that and the bowling alley is when the bowling alley is, no, this is not the exception. This has actually become the rule in this vertical for this use case. So final thoughts, I wanna get, get, get uh, Scott and, and, and Phil up here. Um, just two, two, two kind of final thoughts for you. If you look at all these verticals and as you're thinking about crossing the chasm, and by the way, it's, you, you know, it may be that we're supposed to cross the chasm next year. Because the, the, the early market, until you get a technical whole product that works, it really isn't a very good idea to jump into an application world. Because once you jump into the application world, it's kind of hard to go back and then re-engineer the technology. So I, you could say, you know what, we might need another year doing bespoke projects, get the technical whole product ready, and then jump into the use cases. Because once you jump in, you're not gonna jump back, okay? So, so but here are the kind of things I think you'll see. It, 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 the use cases all have a flavor to them, to me, of optic, op, op, operationalizing and optimizing outcomes at scale. So for media, it's how do I get an optimal use of my content, presumably through ad placements, et cetera, et cetera. Intelligence, it's all about optimizing detection. Investment, it was all about optimizing the investment algorithms, the hedging algorithms, the low latency trading algorithms. Um, advertising, all about about optimizing the performance of the ad, what's the yield, what, you know, kind of that kind of stuff. Fraud, obviously optimizing prevention, regulation and compliance, retail and wholesale, it's all about optimizing inventory turns. Think about how powerful this technology can be once that's deployed at scale for inventory turns. Supply chain, same stuff. In healthcare, it's about optimizing patient outcomes. In education, it's about optimizing learning outcomes. We don't, if you listen to Sal Khan and the Khan Academy, you can just see the beginning of this. But this thing at scale could just be transformative. So there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities for, you, for use cases going here. I think the key message to take away from this thing is, look, for the foreseeable future, it's use cases and the use cases is about domain expertise. So even though you think about yourself as a technical expert or maybe some of, group of people here, you're, when you decide it's time to cross the chasm, again, that might not be right now, might be next year, whenever, then you want domain expertise in the outcomes that we're trying to optimize, not in the optimizing technology. You'll know you're crossing the chasm when you have more tracks about Hadoop in healthcare, Hadoop in education, Hadoop in retail, than you have, you know, about how MapReduce can work with Bayesian algorithms to create, you know, whatever the heck it is, right? Kind of thing, okay, all right. So that's the key, okay? So keep your eyes out for domain experts. Second thing about this thing about big data analytics, just a, a final thought here as an outsider, and you guys know much more about this than I do, but let's not forget that the system of record, the SQL row in the large table, is a fundamentally foundational part of big data. Arguably, it may become the schema for big data. But anyway, it's, it, it's foundational. Log files are the other foundation. That's what's weird to everybody who grew up in IT in my generation. Log files were something that only people who ran the networks knew about or ran, or, or ran, the, or ran the, the data center, and nobody else ever looked at them, nor did they ever think they were important. Okay? And now, all of a sudden, log files have become actually the new, the new currency. It's really, really weird for somebody who grew up in enterprise IT to, to, to grok that. Okay, so batch analysis, MapReduce. Okay, let's, let's do this kind of stuff to detect the pattern. Let's take that pattern and put it into one or more algorithms. Let's take the, oh, oops, what happened? What did I do? No, blank, oh, there we go. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's put, the, okay. Uh, 
we'll, we'll put algorithms, then we'll put the algorithms into real-time computing situations. So this is so different from BI. BI was all about educating people. We're not educating people anymore. They're too slow and they don't scale. Right? We're educating computers. Right? So real-time computing, insert the algorithm, run the processes, make real-time adjustments, outcomes are captured in logs, rinse and repeat. Right? That will be the fundamental, that'll be the fundamental rhythm uh, of, of this journey, going over and over and over again. We've, we've been taught this rhythm by Google and Facebook and, and those guys. We're gonna take that rhythm and say, you know what, that, that dance tune, the entire race can dance to that beat. Okay, that's, that's what we need to do. Right? So in that world, the deal, the, the key takeaway is, look, this should provide at least a decade of entertainment for everybody present, okay? <laughs> That's it. Well, listen, I want to bring Scott back up. So listen, thank you very much. I enjoyed having a chance to talk to you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.